Hello, and welcome to Books in the World. This television program is produced by the Cape Media Center and Cape Cod Writers Center, an organization dedicated for over 60 years to the support and education of writers everywhere. Every summer, the center hosts a four-day conference here on Cape Cod, along with many other events, classes, and programs throughout the year. More information on this center can be found at www.capecodwriterscenter.org. This program, Books in the World, is the longest-running literary cable television show of its kind in the country, airing its first broadcast in 1978. I'm Kathy Aspen, and today I'm here with Roger A. Smith, author of the Regan, the <laughs> I knew I was going to do it, the Regan Classic. Krieger series about an adventurous, resortful, resourceful, and headstrong tomboy named Regan Krieger who provides readers with an amazing vehicle through which they can experience the many important and sometimes lost aspects of the 19th century American and world history. Nice. <laughs> Did you like that? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> We're specifically here to talk about book three of the series, The Blackmailer, which was published this year by Milford House Press. Welcome, Raj. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Before we talk about the book, let's talk a little bit about your background, because Really, when I read your background as an experienced junkie, I am so happy <laughs> to see so many parts and pieces that led you to this moment. So, tell me first about your fascination with railroads. Oh, I, I've been fascinated with railroads since I was a kid. Uh, it was, uh, in the beginning, it was merely uh, model trains, mm -hmm. but uh, when I became an adult, it became steam railroads and steam engines in general and anything that goes chush, 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 I'm yeah. just happy with. Well, it sounds like it's a very, uh, almost an engineering background with the, you know, your love of canals and all of the, uh, the I, things that... I actually thought I was going to be an engineer when I went off to college and then my uh, freshman year physics professor made a deal with me which was, I'll give you a C if you get out of the program. <laughs> so <laughs> That happens. My it's... engineering career came to a screeching halt. And then what, cho um, what was your field of choice I, after that? Uh, actually, uh, the prism that I look through to life and the world is history. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was pretty natural for me to eventually gravitate to teaching history. Mm -hmm. And that's what I started out as. And then uh, had a checkered career after that. I, I uh, taught mentally gifted students, uh, kids with an IQ of 130 and above for mm -hmm. uh, a a bunch of years and then I uh, left that. I got into the summer programming business. I ran a summer camp. I started a science museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a participatory science museum. I got back into the uh, camping business. Uh, we had programs all over the Western Hemisphere taking kids backpacking, rock climbing, caving, surfing, windsurfing, kayaking, sea kayaking and uh, from literally from Ireland to Hawaii and from Alaska to uh, Panama. So we were all over the lot. Wow. And then uh, I started, I uh, took, I sold that and I took uh, um, charge of a rural arts council in central Pennsylvania mm -hmm. where m my wife and I lived uh, on a farm. And then um, I did that for nine years and now I'm a novelist. So. Wow. So nope, had you, you been can't writing connect all dots. You, no, I just heard somebody interviewed recently, and they said that their career traje trajectory looked like an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> Bingo. That's good. That works. Um, but with your career trajectory, because you've always been in history, were you mm -hmm. always writing about history as well, or was it mostly teaching it? Uh, it was certainly teaching it in the beginning. My writing was always... Um, quarterly reports and, and brochure copy when I own my own business and, and director's reports and things like that. And it was only uh, uh, in the last seven years that I've really unleashed that creative aspect. Okay, so seven years is, um, is not a long time mm -mm. to have accomplished as much as you have. <laughs> um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the series itself? I know it's based on um, Rian Krieger. Mm -hmm. Very who, good. <laughs> you know how in your mind when you read, you, you read it a certain way and then you realize. It's classic. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, so, but I know it's based on that from the time that she is 
10 does the 11 scene start? 11 years old. 11, uh -huh. okay. And then you're going to take us through uh, glimpses, which are really uh, close-up glimpses of different aspects of history, mm -hmm. looking through her eyes mm -hmm. as this protagonist who is also a very exciting character mm -hmm. of her own. Mm -hmm. um, and so why don't you give us just a very... A, a little short synopsis of the first two novels, and then we'll dive into this one. Uh, well, in, we meet Rian as an 11-year-old tomboy in 1835 Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rian uh, wants to uh, eventually run her uncle's locomotive manufacturing uh, company. And, and, uh, but there's some problems. First of all, uh, women didn't do that. Uh, she likes to wear boys' clothing. Uh, she uh, uh, has a n the good fortune of having a number of mentors. Her next door neighbor is Lucretia Mott, who is at the time noted as an abolitionist. Eventually, Lucretia is going to participate in the, uh, uh, the uh, Women's Rights Convention in 1848, but that's far off. And by the way, as a history teacher, that's what I taught about Lucretia Ma. Yeah. It wasn't that she was an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I also only taught about Lucretia during Women's History Month, which is an embarrassment to me. But right, that's that we had a month. One of the yeah, you got a whole month. <laughs> we got a month. What do you want? I and, know. and and that is one of the wrongs yeah. that I am trying to right as mm -hmm. I as I am doing this because the history that I am bringing to light is much different than the history that I taught in the 1970s, and it's. Be you know, much has changed and, and much has not changed. Well, and was it that you just simply didn't know that history because it wasn't out there? It yes. wasn't available? Yes, 100%. 100%. And as a teacher, it definitely wasn't available. You had a curriculum to stick, stick to and... Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, not, uh, and I'm not, uh, I, I accept my share of blame for it, but, but it is, yes, it is what it was. And, and now, here it is 50 years later, and right. I'm trying to bring to light people and movements that were marginalized and have been just kind of written out of history or totally ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, Philadelphia during the 1830s was, was an extremely interesting time. Uh, there was, for instance, a very vibrant black middle class in Philadelphia during this time. One of the richest men in Philadelphia was a guy by the name of James Fortin. He was a sailmaker on the Delaware River, uh, owned a sailmaking loft. And he ran a mixed shop. He was a black guy. Uh, he ran a mixed shop of white and, black, and, and uh, African Americans. And, and um, things were relatively peaceful. Right. His son-in-law uh, uh, was uh, a guy by the name of Robert Purvis, also wealthy. And these folks funded libraries, they self-help organizations, temperance organizations, literary societies. and, and yeah, if they're I didn't missing, teach them. They're missing. Yeah, missing in history. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Is um, tell us how. Um, I know that Regan's father is Otto. Right. And he starts out with regular coaches, right? Yes. Not in in uh, locomotives. Right. So 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 we're back to a point where all of a sudden there's all this innovation coming out with, uh, you know, the way that. Um, uh, things are made and, mm -hmm. and steam and all yes. of the things that create the ability to have um, the railroads. And he just makes that jump into it. And, and there are historical precedents for that. Um, Otto uh, w was a, uh, a coach maker, mm -hmm. uh, a carriage maker, and he decides, well, here's this new industry. And I'm by new in 1835, we're literally talking about uh, four or five years old. That, that yeah. and. And the first maker, the, the first manufacturers of, of steam locomotives um, in the United States, some of them were watchmakers previously. Wow. So it's just kind of like, how do you make the leap? But the more digging you do, the more uh, you find out that there were folks who were farmers who also got into m making alcohol and, right. and they just, they, yeah, they, they didn't, there were no barriers. They right. just figured, what the heck? Nobody right. else is doing I mean, it. I'm going to give it a try. Maker, if you're working with parts and pieces, you're working with parts and pieces. Yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of size. Yeah. Was um, I know that um, from the very beginning, uh, Rian is dressed, Rian dresses herself and portrays herself as a boy. Yes. And whether she's in the factory, whether she's out about town, that's right. how she. Um, and how how it, does everyone realize that she is a girl? 
No. Uh, she's, uh, first of all, she's only 11 years old, so there's a little bit of androgynousness. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually um, is, uh, the sto Rian story arc also um, uh, follows my own son's uh, story arc. Um, my son was um, assigned female at birth, mm -hmm. and, and uh, was androgynous into age 14, dressed like a guy, uh, was mistaken for a guy, yeah. um, mostly, and uh, then uh, decided, not decided, came to the realization that uh, uh, she was uh, um, gay, mm -hmm and went through the rest of high school that way, and then went off to college, and uh, partway through college, kind of said, eh, really, nope, um, I'm a guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, I've, as a novelist, I figured my job was to, to uh, make my pro protagonist job as complex and as difficult as possible, and what could be more difficult than oh. being transgender Absolutely. in an era before the, 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 the term was even coined. even coined and there were no mentors, there were no mm -hmm. guides, there were no precedents, there were, you're there off right. blazing your own path and um, you know there, so there's um, a great deal of integrity in Rian Krieger's uh, uh, fiber uh, just trying to figure out who they are during this era. Well, and also a naturalness about it. There's no, uh, in the writing and also in the character development, you don't feel like anything is forced. You uh, feel like this you. is just how this person views their life. And, um, and other than a little frustration over having to keep it a secret, mm -hmm. which also, you know, the numbers game, you know, she's in this third book, she's in Russia, and mm -hmm. they want to know, like, well, how many people already know that you're not, right. you're not my coachman, right. you're not a boy, you're not, like, I know now you're the companion to the czar's, you know, 10-year-old son, mm -hmm. like, and the czar thinks you're a boy. Like, that's a bit of a problem, yes. Where's this going to go? <laughs> yes, that's a bit of a problem, yeah. exactly. Um, how much of this, did you, did you clear this with your, like, how does that work with your son and your family? Were they behind you 100% on this trajectory? For yes. This? They were. Yeah. Uh, that is, um, uh, I would never do this without, uh, yes. without permission because it is uh, very uh, exposing. Exactly. Uh, on, on the other hand, not that I uh, have direct experience with the other. I mm -hmm. do have vicarious experience. So it gives me a little bit of credibility to say, yes, I am right. a uh, right. proud father of a transgender son. Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful that this is how you decided to go ahead and, um, and uh, um, create this character. Mm -hmm. because, uh, because of course all of this existed throughout history, of course. I've, I've actually had the question. You know, yeah. um, people who, say, who ask me, were there really transgender people back then? And, and the answer is yes, of course, absolutely. I mean, in some of the rural areas, you'll read literature where um, where women, in order to get by, would dress like a man so that they weren't going to be, uh, you know, taken on a trail if they mm -hmm. were going to be out there hunting for their day's food or they're absolutely. going to be yeah. So there was right. a lot of a lot of self defense that happened that way and, too. And um, folks who um, joined the military. Right. Right. Exactly, exactly. As as one gender that they didn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is um, I, okay. So the research. This is so. <laughs> this is so meticulously researched. Um, when I, when I read it the first time, I felt. Um, I wouldn't say ignorant. I would say uninformed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Fine. And if that's what you were trying to get from your reader, where they could actually take this journey and say. Oh my gosh! I didn't know this, and I didn't know that, and that's, that's yeah, actually music to my ears. And of what I know about Russia, I mean, it's sad. I know very little mm -hmm. about it, and feel mm -hmm. like I learned more about the history of Russia in this in this particular. Oh, that's round. grand. And I know that you had um, each of the novels has a focus that is around an actual historical mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. Like the first novel was the cracking of the Liberty Bell. 
Um, the second one was the destruction of Tsar Nicholas's palace. Mm -hmm. And then this one is the burning down of the Pennsylvania Hall, um, which was, was that in 1938? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And is that, do you start with that focus or is that something you're gonna continue on? Oh wait, first let's tell people, it's going to be nine novels, just yes. so that. <laughs> right. <We're, laughs> which already makes me tired. <laughs> we are going For to you. <laughs> get well into the Civil War by the time uh, yeah. book nine is, is complete. And, and actually, with a fast forward up into the 1915s, we're going to return oh, to the okay. Liberty Bell in 1915, uh, which anybody who wants to Google it, Google it can figure out what happens to the Liberty Bell in 1915. 1915 yeah. But in, in any case, um, the, um, there, is, there are significant events that are pivot points in each of the books that, mm -hmm. that come around. And, uh, I, I, the burning of Pennsylvania Hall is very special to me. Uh, it's symbolic of my own ignorance because, once again, this is one of the things that I didn't teach in the 1970s. Uh, I wasn't even aware of it. And, and it is, Philadelphia in this era is a very uh, interesting. Wait, and you were t teaching in Pennsylvania? I, well, I was teaching gifted kids in Pennsylvania. I was teaching history in, um, in New York State. In New York, okay. Right. All right. Uh, but close enough yeah. that I should have known better. But it's, um, it, I think, to, uh, Pennsylvania Hall was built uh, by um, the, uh, a number of abolitionist societies to act as a gathering place for conventions to house a, uh, a um, uh, free produce store. Free produce was anything that wasn't tainted by slave labor. Mm -hmm. So it, in other words, much like organic food today is, cotton was more expensive, molasses was more expensive, rice, uh, uh, things like that that were grown in southern climes. Right. Uh, and uh, so finding, sourcing things that were not uh, tainted by slavery was, was a difficult thing, but also a, um, an anti-slavery newspaper. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Hall could house 3,000 people in wow. a convention. So, and it was a showcase. It was the most, it was the largest building in Pennsylvania. It was the most modern building in Pennsylvania. It was dedicated in May of 1838, and four days later, it was burned to the ground. And tell me, well, it, without, <laughs> it's actual history, so you can mm -hmm. tell me about, about, about the fire. Uh, there, it, it, it was pretty well telegraphed in the sense that um, uh, um, uh, crowds of, uh, Unfriendly people had been gathering around it as the conventions, uh, the first convention uh, was taking place, mm -hmm. and uh, they started throwing stones. Um, um, William Lloyd Garrison was a speaker. He was jeered. Lucretia Mott was a speaker. She was jeered from the outside. Mm -hmm. People tried to break in. They were wrestled out. Uh, the, they canceled the evening program for fear that somebody was going to get right. hurt, and that That's night when it was the place was burned down set on fire. by a mob. That's crazy. Let's go back to your research a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, do you sleep ever? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I look at this and I think <laughs> it, it is funny that each you, book could be a life's work. Okay. <laughs> I, my mode of work is, is first of all, I, I write seven days a week mm -hmm. and I start as, uh, as soon after I brush my teeth, I'm, really? I'm writing. So the coffee's in your hand and Co you're at the computer. Coffee in hand. Okay. And I'm blessed with, by the fact that I have a Great Dane. Great Danes sleep until 1030 in the morning <laughs> so she doesn't bug me. Yeah. Uh, and my wife just knows that she understands it this um, is how it's going to be i'm just I, i'm dialed in and that's mm -hmm. it so i write and then uh my afternoon is whatever my afternoons are not writing uh but the last thing that i do before i go to bed is i read what i wrote that morning and i swear i am sleeping but my brain hasn't I have said this many stopped. times raj that's exactly how i feel about it if i put it in my head before i go to bed Another chapter is written in my sleep. It's, it's just <laughs> yeah. magnificent. And it I, is magnificent. I love it. Yeah. I love doing it that way. And as far as the research goes, I think if you look at uh, my, my first book, at that time, 
uh, you used the word meticulous, which it's very gratifying to hear you say that. I felt kind of like a poser writing my first book because, you know, it's just, it was all, not all new, but it was, uh, it was un, um, unrefined, okay. what, I was, what I was putting into the book. But now I've been living in the 1830s and 40s for seven years. Oh, how, right. So, so uh, um, there is much that I just know that is, it, it, it's just back there someplace, mm -hmm. and it just spews out of me. I mean, I, my, I'm writing book four now, and it, um, it's writing itself. I just, and so you have a backdrop of information that you've gathered that can factor in, yep. even information that you haven't used in current oh, yeah. books, but that came up on some level while you were researching. Absolutely. And then it can just be tucked into this next novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's like you knew in, in advance. <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun to be Tell where me I am about, right now. I know it, it, it's. I have some. I have another um, author who was talking to me about writing. She's got a ten book series. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was talking about, uh, well, hers actually is again the same protagonist, mm -hmm. um, and she was talking about how difficult it is for her to um, be talking about book two and writing book four <sighs> because she's got them in a totally different, you know, and sometimes she throws in things that aren't quite pertinent to the day or the time period. Is that happening for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, because Rian, as a 17-year-old, isn't, doesn't act or sound like a 13-year-old. Right. People react to Rian differently based, I mean, Rian as a 17-year-old is a much more powerful individual. Rian is coming Rian in. Rian was pretty powerful at 14. <laughs> well, uh, as, as a 17-year-old, um, just extrapolate, and therefore, I, I can't, uh, I as another character can't react to her like she's, 14, okay. I react like, holy mackerel, this person's knocking me back on my heels. Is there and any, is there any part of this, is there any in, in ahead, and you don't have to give away anything that you don't want to give away, um, I mean, although I've been good at forcing people to do it, <laughs> bend to my will on that, um, is there a point in the story of Regan Krieger where she starts to then be referred to as he, and yes. where you're, there is that point? Yes. Okay. But so, Regan won't, well... Okay, yes. You, okay, just you, yes is you, good enough. You Jedi I, mind me on, uh, mind tricked me on that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm glad I did. But is there any part of you that are, are any of the characters? Is there somebody that you kind of say, this is my, this is my character? Oh, my goodness. Um, the answer is no, but um, there are, uh, Rian and I, uh, our, our major common trait is that we need to be busy all the time. Right. Oh, that's definitely. If, if, she in this book is. if I am not busy, my brain is. Uh, my brain go descends into very dark thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, in order to keep the 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 uh, uh, the dark thoughts at bay, I'm I'm. If yeah. I'm not writing, then I'm down in my wood shop. If I'm not in my wood shop, then I'm walking on the beach. You know, it's okay. just it's just. Uh, so you never just sit there and scroll TikTok just mindlessly. What happens? You don't no. have a favorite binge television show that you have to watch. Uh, I, I do end the day by watching currently The West Wing. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, this time of. Of, of the season, I think everyone goes to the West Wing. It's the go-to. <laughs> yeah, we're in West Wing season. It's timely. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that is great. Um, and then, what is um, your schedule like when it comes to book events and things like that? Are you, have you been? Because uh, this book is so ripe for things like speaking at every college and every. It, it, you, do you have an end game for the book? Let's ask that first. Do you have an end game for where this series is going to go? Do you picture it being? Because it's, it's a series. It is a Netflix series. Uh, I, I attended a um, writer's night out at, at the Cape Cod. It was a, it was a Zoom session um, from, offered by the Cape Cod Writer Center mm -hmm. um, about getting your book made into a, a series and, or into, into some yeah. cinematic something or other. And the takeaway that I had was you need an agent, you need a manager, you need money, you need all this stuff. Or... 
you need to just by happenstance be sitting next to Steven Spielberg when you're flying plane. in an airplane. <laughs> yes. And I thought, I'm going to take option number two. So if it happens, that would be delightful. And what's your pitch for Steven Spielberg? Oh, my you've goodness. Got a, you've got a minute. The plane is going down. Uh, uh, you know he wants to call his family. <laughs> but, you're, but you're literally going to tell him your pitch. Yeah. Reed Krieger's journey uh, is a physical as well as physical journey as well as a journey of self-discovery for Rian Krieger, who we meet as an 11-year-old, and we're going to follow uh, until they are 91 years old. Mm, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, do you have... <laughs> and we go through many of the pivotal events uh, in, history. in American history. Well, that, that piece of attaching, I mean, there are historical novels, but this one has been really... Oh, wait, who's your target audience? Oh, that's, that's and right a, after that we have to close this down. Okay. And you have to tell me what your website is. Real quick, uh, my target audience uh, is people who like historical novels, but mm -hmm. I am getting folks who have read my books and they say, "Can I buy another one because I want to give it to my daughter, to yes. my grandson, to my you know yeah. granddaughter, whoever it is, my niece." And, and it's as so much I a journey think, as Lord of the Rings. Let me tell you, when you're. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who feel as though this is a YA. Yeah, book, and I, I do feel as though it's quite It's definitely a cross, a cross between mm -hmm. YA and adult, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Okay, so tell us where we can find your work. Uh, www.rogeracmith.com. That is fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us today for Books in the World. This was really wonderful. If you'd like to know more about Books in the World, it is, again, www.capecodwriterscenter.com, oops, .org, and you can also find our videos on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Good stuff.